Well, hello, Finland. Hello, Tarja. It's my honor to join you today in April, around the 28th, because this April is a time, it's springtime, right? Well, it's springtime in education for all of us with the various new forms of learning, new forms of technology that are changing the world. I'll call this education 3.0, if you would like. You can see the picture there. I was doing a massive open online course or a MOOC there. It's called MOOC and being in MOOCing stance. Now, you might not want to offer MOOC, but there are other things you can do in this wonderful world of education 3.0. You know, this is a time or an age in which we're moving away from Confucius time of didactic, direct instruction, and having obedient students listening to us, to an age in which Rip Van Winkle could wake up from a long sleep and see that schools have finally changed. They're not the same as when he went to, to sleep hundreds of years ago. We're in a change status or mode today. We're in a, in a, in a state of evolution of education today. We're removing from instructor as credit manager, someone assessing student learning, to someone who might facilitate and orchestrate that learning, curate and find the golden nuggets for all people to use whenever it's important to use them, finding those gems out there in your content field and sharing them with your colleagues, okay? Being a concierge in a hotel with customer service coming up and handing them some secret little map of things that they might go off and do today or tomorrow, depending upon the weather conditions that are out in amongst us. You see, we're in this new age of instructor that provides just-in-time support when one needs it. You might get a sense of it by reading some books. I tend to do that once in a while. I'm sure you read a book once in a while, or at least put it on your head. Osmosis still works. Well, maybe not. But there's books today on creativity and innovation. Let me tell you, they're coming out in droves, in droves, Invent to Learn being one. How students tinker with their knowledge, tinker with the creation of new products, and invent new ideas or models or frameworks. We're in an age of tinkering, this maker movement, making things with a 3D printer. We have to change our mindsets a bit. Carol Dweck said we need to move from stationary, static, mindsets of what intelligence is, fixed notions of intelligence, to ones that are growth mindsets, that we can change our abilities through our own actions, that we're not depending upon um, someone telling us that we're smart or not smart. We control our destinies, if you will. Read this book and it talks about how to foster a sense of students' growth mindset. We are wired to create Wired to Create, Unraveling the Mysteries of the Creative Mind, a book I've listened to in my car twice in the past few weeks. Actually, I started three times. I like this book so much. It's from UPenn, a UPenn professor and a colleague, and they go through the research on creativity. These are just a couple of the books out there on creativity. Find some of your own. There's dozens of them coming up because what they're saying to us is, hey, we're not going to be sticking people to a workstation anymore like we were in the past. Remember programming? Anyone remembers punch of cards? You're certifiably old, okay? Or zip of discs or CDs. We're moving to an age where students share and collaborate around their iPads or their laptops or their smartphones or whatever it is they have attached to your appendage, okay? We're moving away from traditional forms of instruction, didactic, to ones in which we're forming collaborative teams and we're sharing in social media. We are orchestrating learning as an instructor, facilitating that opportunity for students to share groups internationally, collaboratively, globally with one another. We've moved ahead from those early ages of learning, those initial steps of learning. We've moved 30 years ahead from my first days in grad school in 1986 to here in April 2016. Today, anyone can learn anything from anyone else at any time. These are exciting times for all of us to learn. There are at least, at least, at least 30 ways in which learning's changed. At least 30 ways. This is making me go crazy. I'm going 
bonkers, if you will, with all these changes happening around us today. And I'm sure you are too. And, and your supervisors, your colleagues, your deans, or your department chairs, or your superintendents of the schools are saying, hey, try this out. Try this new thing out, this little, you know, and I'm tired of that. What we need are frameworks to think about using all these new fangled technologies wrapped around us. Because learning today, say it with me, read or off the screen. It's more, come on, people in Finland, it's more informal. You got it so far? We're going to read the whole thing. It's more informal, video-based, ubiquitous, collaborative, self-directed, global, mobile, open and massive. Yes, you said it. Very good. I'll give you a round of applause. Nicely done. See, technology is wrapped around all of us. You see the people almost, you know, they're grabbing their, they're running on their exercise bicycles and they're checking their email and whatnot today. We've got learning wrapped around us at all times. We are in the learning century. This make no mistake about it. We are in the learning century. We we have our smartphones. We, we take a course from on our smartphone. My Samsung six here. You might have an, an iPhone. How many of you have iPhones? By the way, raise your hands. How many have Nokia? <laughs> Trick question. I don't know. People in Finland, you better have Nokia's or not Ericsson's. Well, how many have Samsung sixes or sevens like me? Okay, mobile learning is one way in which learning is changing for all of us. And in India. They've just developed a $3.67 USD smartphone. So when you have a flash memory stick, and that flash memory stick can hold a terabyte of data for $1 USD, and you have a laptop computer in India for $10, and you have a smartphone for $4, you can add everything you want for less than $15 USD, a whole school, in effect. Now we have smartwatches. How many of you have a smartwatch? You know, I have a dumb watch, okay? You might have a smart watch. I'll share and exchange my watch for your watch, okay? I'm happy to give you, this is a nice, it's not a Rolex, look at that stretch band. I'm happy to share, I'll take your smart watch for my, my, dumb, my dumb watch, okay? So, learning's more mobile. We're learning complete courses on our mobile devices or downloading to our flash memory sticks to retrieve at a later point in time. You might organize your schedule in a smart watch. Some people are so addicted to their smartphones and whatnot, they are they are walking down the streets and getting hit by cars. They, one person in Seattle ran into a bear. Somebody in California fell off a ledge a couple weeks ago. People in Hong Kong there are zombies on the subway station when I saw them there last summer. Where some of you are zombies today. You're suffering from nomophobia, nomophobia, addicted to your phones. How many of you raise your hands would feel Afraid, afraid if you if your battery got low on your mobile device. How many would feel afraid or tense if you lost your mobile phone? You are suffering. Those raising your hands are suffering from no homophobia. It's going to be a psychological addiction soon, but be careful. The second way learning's changing, it's become more video based. We have a young kid there, age 10, becoming the inter international junior champion in golf from practicing in the sugarcane fields of India and watching Tiger Wood videos in YouTube. He learned from YouTube videos. We are moving from an age of Wikipedia to Videopedia. Make no mistake. We, we, bandwidth has gone up thanks to the Finns and others, uh, Norwegians as well. But bandwidth has, has expanded. Capacity to share. We've got uh, lower costs of hard drives and whatnot in and, and the cloud. Learning is more video-based. We've moved from the age of text-based learning to video-based learning with TED Talks and YouTube and, and MasterChef and Clip Chef to learn what to cook tonight. This is a wonderful age of also game-based learning, challenges, accomplishments, leaderboards. How do we gamify education across the spectrum in maths and in science and in English to get students engaged in that learning process today? Learning is more collaborative with Skype or Google Hangouts. What we use here at Indiana is something called Zoom. And actually on my screen here, I'm doing a, a Zoom. You'll see on the screen there it says Zoom recording. I recommend Zoom if you get a chance. You can have up to 100 people in Zoom for really crisp, high-definition kinds of things. 
We bring in guest speakers from around the world. We bring in authors whose books we're reading. We bring in students who have graduated to bring them back to talk about the course and what they learned. We bring back instructors and teachers who created the class 20 years ago to talk about the early days of the class. Learning can be collaborative in many ways. Having students do joint book projects, wiki books, having students do cross-cultural exchanges of their research findings or whatever. Learning is also more digital. And of course it is. You know, we're, we're learning. How many of you read a book off of your Kindle or your iPad or your Samsung or whatever Galaxy devices or any kind of graphic, any kind of graphic or tablet computer? We're learning is more digital today. And that's exciting because when that happens, we can, we can e-purpose content. We can create simulations in the midst of reading. We can create, you know, the re uh, a reenactment of the Battle of the Bulge, for instance, or whatever. And so you can have simulations, animations, juxtaposing pictures against text and other things. Learning is more adventurous. My friend Aaron Daring from the University of Minnesota, where many Finns and Norwegians and Swedes end up living up there in Minnesota, you betcha. Up where, up not, well, there's no fjords up there, but, but they talk funny like that. Anyhow, learning is more adventurous. Aaron Deering studies people north of 60 degrees latitude. He looks at cultures of the world and shares it with students around the world, what's going on there in those cultures. Take a look at his Chasing Seals project. Take, take a look at his geothentic learning project where they do geography around points of interest like the Louvois and the Golden Gate Bridge. Take a look at his Polar Husky project where they follow explorers to the North Pole. Learning is also more immediate and rich. When you find a new gigantic lemur in Madagascar, what happens today is you don't have to wait two years to get in a textbook. CNN will have something up, International CNN or the BBC or some news organization will post that finding with pictures, with interviews of the researchers. And that same day, Nature Magazine or some other academic outlet will publish the scientific side. Or the website will go live. Or we'll get Sir David Attenborough in the UK to talk about the importance of this finding. Science today is immediate and rich. We don't have to wait two years to get out in a book. When we have a missing link being found, a new species being found, or a connection in our evolutionary history emerging from Africa or somewhere else in the world, we don't have to wait anymore. That science becomes available. That jawbone is in the news here, you see in CNN, with a timeline. Maybe there's some other, you know, case uh, discussion with, with experts comparing this finding to another. There might be some kind of interactive uh, animation of the finding. There's a dinosaur being found every week, for instance, the largest dinosaur ever found. Um, the titanosaur, I believe, was recently found. So science is in the news all the time. Find ways to use the news in learning. Learning is also more hands-on. Hands-on. The Makey Makey and the Kano will let kids create and build computers for less than 100 USD or not much more than that, they put these computers together and learn how to code or program in hackathons. And they can use a, you see the banana as a space bar. You want multiple bananas? You can have a player piano. Hands-on learning like Maker Labs that we have here at Indiana University. I've been here for about 24 years and in the past few months we've just added a Maker Lab, which are, we're training teachers how to get their students more engaged in the learning process by designing new idea, uh, their ideas, making them with 3D printers and whatnot. Learning is also more personal. We have Yoda there offering his support in our backpack. We're not quite there yet. We don't have Yoda in our backpacks. But personalized learning means we might localize the content for different languages like Finnish language or Arabic or Mandarin Chinese. We personalize the learning for people so they're not subjugated to, to just learning from English and, and uh, or Western cultures. We also might personalize the learning by providing hints and cues and prompts and scaffolds when students need it. You also might provide an artificial intelligent agents in the computer to give students feedback on their learning. Learning is moving in a personalized way because the web offers more options, more an assortment of possibilities to learn, then we can personalize that learning process. You give them choice, you give them flexibility, you give them options. The students feel better, you feel better as educators. It's a win-win, although I hate the expression win-win. 
But I don't want to say lose-lose either. Learning is more blended, and blended can mean many things, but it often means combining online and face-to-face -face instruction. Aspects of the learning being anywhere, any place, any time, and aspects of it might be face-to-face -face in a classroom, a traditional setting, with marker boards or discussions and so forth. Some of it might be online practice tests and quizzes, or online videos to reflect on, or online articles to read. We allow students to self-direct a piece of their learning and then guide them back when they come meet us face to face. And in fact, self-directed learning is one of the 30 ways that learning is changing in front of our eyes. The learning might be up in the cloud somewhere with grandmothers in the cloud, the granny cloud up there somewhere. Grandmothers in the UK, maybe in Finland too. Grandmothers in the UK are definitely offering feedback and advice to kids in India, tutoring them and helping guide their learning when they need it. So they call that the granny cloud. Sagata Mitra from the UK has created this concept of self-organized learning environments, soul. I have self-directed open learning environments. I have a different soul. I have a different kind of soul, but soul nonetheless. Souls are helping us get education out to masses of people to utilize free and open content and provide mentoring when needed. We also have more global education or Skype classrooms. A Skype classroom is one where your class might use Skype to go online and have a discussion with other people around the world with, with the technologies you use. It might not be Skype. It might be Zoom. It might be Google Hangouts. It might be Blackboard Collaborate or something else. But when you have refugees in Kenya accessing the internet and talking to one another, we are now exploring by the seat of our pants, as the expression is there. Learning is moving global so that your peers your children might be going to school with, you might be going to school with, with peers around the world. Your kids will pick their teachers from anywhere around the world at some point in the next few years. Learning is more synchronous. So I, I mentioned Zoom earlier with this machine, but here's a bigger projection of Zoom. We've got, what, about 20 people there in a Zoom collaboration. Uh, these are people coming from Europe to the U.S. for a meeting. And it's just like that. Everyone can talk. They can share their screen. You can chat. You can save the recording and share it. Learning is more online. Migrant workers coming from Syria and Turkey and other places that might have internal strifes, maybe they're coming from Lebanon, maybe they're coming from Afghanistan or Pakistan, going through Turkey on the way to Germany and France and Belgium and other places, are not allowed to take a class until they're there a year. Now, a university in Germany, Kieran University, lets people take courses from Harvard and MIT and other places, MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. I think I have my MOOCs book here. I threw it somewhere here. Here it is behind me. Here's another one behind me. As I mentioned earlier, I recently did one. If you go to MOOCsbook.com, you can download the free beginning of the book and part of the ending that we've made available free for people, or write me an email if you'd like to learn more. So let's just review here, and I'll end with my other book on motivation. Learning has become more informal. You all say this with me again. One, two, three. It's more informal, video-based, ubiquitous, collaborative, self-directed, global, mobile, open, mass, very nicely done. Very, it, it, and it's more than that. These are only a few of the ways that learning's changing for all of us. It's an exciting time. These are, these are immensely important changes, and if any one of these had happened, if any one thing, it'd be a revolution. But we've got at least 30 things that are changing learning. We're in a massive revolution. A convergence of things are simultaneously happening to change the possibilities for all of us to learn. And let me just point out one last thing. We're in a web of learning. My book, The World is Open, points out we're in a gigantic web of learning where kitty cats and squirrels are learning even. Well, maybe not kitty cats and squirrels, but you get the point. If we rename the web the web of learning, Politicians would pay more attention to it. We would have more upper, we'd have more ideas and examples and success stories out there. We should be talking about this gigantic web of learning. We have blogs and wikis and videos and podcast shows and whatnot. But we're at a jumping off point and we're really not sure where we're going. So all of you stand with me here. Everyone stand up in Finland. I don't know if you're in Helsinki or Haimalina or are you in Joensu or in Turku or Olu. I've been to all those places and more. Uh, Kupio, 
and uh, Ro Rovaniemi. Okay, everyone from Finland on the count of three, all the women are going to jump. All the women. One, two, three, jump. And now all the men. One, two, three, jump. And everyone together. One, two, three, jump. Because you're going to have a seat now. We are at a jumping off point, and when we're at a jumping off point, we need frameworks to think from. Frameworks like my Tech Variety Framework. This book is free. Go to techvariety.com, download the book with 100 ideas on how to motivate students online. I have another book with my Read, Reflect, Display, and Do model, R2-D2, Star Wars model, that also has 100 ideas in it. It's not free. This one's free. It's in free in Chinese as well, if any of you speak Chinese. Someone can translate it to Finnish, maybe, for me. Anyhow, um, it provides examples on how to give feedback how to foster autonomy, engagement, how to create tension, and how to build products and create a safe tone or climate. So tone, encouragement, curiosity, variety, autonomy, interactivity, engagement, tension, and yielding products. Tech variety. Go to tech-variety.com or no dash. You can download the book. In there, we have examples of using Google Cardboard for interactive expeditions and adventure kinds of learning experiences. Actually, you don't see the cardboard here because it's over the top. But anyhow, you put your iPhone or some other mobile device in there, and you see the little lenses there that you can take off and meet that titanosaur or go to the new Stonehenge that they just found uh, nearby the, the um, Stonehenge, original Stonehenge that was found. You can, you can search these exhibits and find new things. Museums online. There's actually a, 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 a next to the Smithsonian. There is the Newseum, News of the World. Bringing in current events and news can excite your students to learn. So number five in the Tech Variety model is autonomy and choice. Number three we had there was curiosity and fun. So number five is autonomy and choice. Give them case A or case B from the museum, cases to solve. Relevance and meaningfulness. Looking at the polar ice cap shrinking here with an animation getting students to see it and visualize it, making it meaningful for them, engage them in infographics, have them interpret these infographics or create their own infographics on global warming or climate change or whatever the topic is, build products, have them build videos, share their videos or take tests and quizzes online with interactive videos. So my students create videos, my students create podcast shows and documentaries and all sorts of products to end the class, to show what they've learned. Those are just a few examples of tech variety. It's just a few examples of the technology wrapped around us today. I hope you all have found a few things you can use in your own classes. My email is there. Kurt at worldisopen.com. I'm also cjbunk at indiana.edu. The book is there, techvariety.com. My slides you can download at Training Share. My papers are at Publication Share. Now, Talia will answer questions for you because she's such a smart and lovely and wonderful person that she will help you all understand this gigantic web of learning. She's mastered it when she visited Indiana. She knows what it's about. Um, I highly recommend that you have a discussion of some of these ideas, if you can, during your event there today in Finland. Uh, write me a note. Again, thank you all for coming. Maybe you need to take a break. Uh, but whatever it is, I wish you well in your journey to the web of learning, in your journey in the learning age, the learning century. These are exciting times for me and for you, and better yet, for your students and for their parents and for their peers and friends. Thank you very much.